Welcome to my dad's car. Enjoy. Welcome to My Dad's Car, a podcast discussing our personal relationship with automotive nostalgia. And you know what? It doesn't even have to be about your dad's car. It can be your mum's, your grand's, your parents, guardians, or even a neighbour's. If it made an impression, let's talk about it. Hello. Oh, no, connecting. Oh, I don't know. Have we broken through? Aha, can you hear me, Paul? I can hear you now, yeah. Wonderful, okay. I still haven't got used to all this technology. <laughs> I have, really. <laughs> oh, we've been doing this a year. Yeah, you've kind of called in on the day where it's all gone to finish. <laughs> I know. It's the weather. Blame it on the weather. Hey! I can hear you now. I can hear you. Hey. Can anyone hear Yeah. Is it working? Good Lord. Wow. We should make a go at this, John. We should, shouldn't we? Yeah. Yeah, you should do. A good plan. How are you both doing? Yeah, we're good, thank you. Not too bad, yeah. And yourself? Yeah, good. Doing, doing okay, yeah. Super duper. But yeah, let's jump into it. We're joined by Paul Gardner. And is your business called Speed Broker or is that just your Instagram handle? Or Yeah, no, that's that's the business. Yeah, yeah. What is it you do? Do you want to give us a quick rundown and then we'll explain how we've come to be in this situation? Yeah, of course. Um, we're in, in essence, uh, a concierge service for car collectors and enthusiasts. And we tend to just deal with sales, sourcing and any works that need to be done on cars. And we have... I don't know, kind of formed a bit of a, a base of being people to go to if you've got something unusual, uh, modified, top end, um, classic, supercar. It has kind of gone more that way over the last uh, couple of years. So, yeah, it's interesting. Every day is different and it's what I love doing. So we'll just keep going until until we can't. Yeah. Whereabouts are you based? Um, North London. We work from home. Okay. We just work all the way across the UK. Most of our customers are anything from, you know, Cotswolds, um, mainly sort of south, but we've got clients all over the place, a couple uh, overseas. So it's um, certainly an interesting business. Yeah. Fantastic. And John, do you want to pick up the story for the benefit of the tape? Yeah. So, um, yeah, we do a sort of car spotting tennis type thing, don't we, on the, on our Instagram, mm. just to sort of pad out the content. And, uh, yeah, I spotted a Citroen BX. Um, I think it was just before Christmas, actually, um, last year. Yeah. So it was on our feed. And, uh, yeah, Paul, you stumbled across it, didn't you? And it turns out that you, you're quite familiar with that car. Really familiar with that car. It's really strange because you'll hear as we go through this history of cars, you know, my my life in cars is quite exciting. But where I've come from is like the most boring background of cars ever. <laughs> I've had to kind of pick up interest from uncles and, you know, whoever's around me because my parents were just – utterly dull when it came to cars growing up and that car funnily my dad had a bx years ago a 19 tgd back in 1990 bought it new but this car um i think it was pvc was the number plate at the back Mm. um we bought that probably six seven years ago and that was me approaching him and saying dad look you're so dull when it comes to cars let's start buying things that are interesting now okay you know this one came up and we went to go and pick it up from a guy who'd had it 18 19 years and he was in his 80s right and he was just can't drive it anymore and every time i drive it i keep like bashing it into posts and things so i need someone to take it off my hands and yeah we went and picked up that car and it was it was so strange seeing it there but that's what this world is about isn't it yeah yeah i think from memory i did look up the um did the old mot history checker on it i think it was still pretty low mileage i think it was like sub 100 maybe i'm wrong but i think when we bought it it was about fifty five thousand. yeah there you go, yeah. When we bought it, the guy had done no miles over his ownership. It was that real typical situation where this guy, who's obviously older in years, mm. has bought something he liked and was just toing and froing from like the local shop um, until such time where I think his, his wife sort of said, what's this car doing on our drive? It's just silly. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was very low margin. I think it was 55 or 57,000 miles when we put mm. that one on. Yeah. But that's what I've been trying to do over the over the last few years. I've been sort of saying to my dad, listen, you know, you say you're into cars, but history clearly says otherwise. <laughs> so if there's something you do like, let's go out and find it and buy it. So the last few years, I've been getting my dad to buy all sorts of things, you know, nothing particularly special, but, you know, a TT here and a BX there and a Civic Type R he bought as well. So, Oh, really? Nice. When did the uh, BX leave your um, your family? How long ago did he sell it in? Do you reckon he sold it to the guy John spotted it with? Or 
Quite possibly, yeah. I mean, I would have, actually, I would have dealt with that sale. He, as I say, my dad's one of these people that's just like deal with that for me and can't be bothered with this, and I don't want to take these photos. And you know, he's he's got other things to do. Yeah, yeah. So I, I would have dealt with that, and I, I can't actually remember who we sold it to, but from memory, it was it was an enthusiast, and it was someone who knew everything about the car. We, you know, we didn't have to do much. It was like this is the car for sale. Come and look, and he knew everything. Mm. So yeah, he was an enthusiast, quite possibly. It was him. Um, where did you see it, John? Was it was it in London? No, it, well, South East London, yeah, Sidcup. I was taking my youngest to the doctors, actually, and it was just outside the surgery there. So yeah. I'm assuming, um, I think it was in a disabled bay from memory. It could well be. It could well be. I mean, I think it's one of those cars that I can't see owners like parting ways like that. It's just not one of those cars. I think if no. you're going to buy something like that, you know what you're buying and you'll probably keep hold of it for a while. It's not an accidental car, is it? It's not like a Focus or a Golf even, maybe. You just need an A to B runaround. Oh, I'll, I'll get a Citroen BX. Yeah, it's so quirky. And and I've got a story, actually, about when my dad had his first BX. It was this 1.9 diesel, non-turbo. Even I thought it was slow in 1990, and I was, like, nine years old. But I remember this story. He took me to this shopping centre, uh, Brent Cross, and he was just showing off about the car, about how quirky it was and how French it was. And um, we're in a queue going out, and it's it's just gridlocked going out. But you could go the other way and go all the way round. But in the middle, it was kind of like a dual carriageway exit. There was this really tall curb. And my dad, he went into the full James Bond man. He goes, don't worry, I've got an idea. And he just went to jack up the suspension. He lifted the suspension up. And I remember him going, are we going to go over that bump? And he starts going over this tall curb, which was at least double height, at least. And he proceeds to sort of off-road it over this curb. And on the way down, it just scuffed so badly. <laughs> this whole plan of escaping, the, the, you know, all these sort of boring people in the queue. <laughs> um, and that was his sort of, he's like, wow, the suspension goes up and the suspension goes down. And it was like, okay, cool. Great. Dad's, eh? Yeah. Um, what's your earliest car memory? If we uh, wind the clock back to the beginning. The earliest car memory I don't know how well I remember the car, but I, I remember the story being told even when I was very young, three years old. And my dad had a Peugeot 504. Okay. And I remember he was um, doing some work on it outside our old flat or whatever. And my brother was in the car messing around and my dad hadn't like jacked it, secured it properly. And I remember him saying that it'd come off the jacks and, and rolled down the hill and he chased my brother who was, you know, four or five years old at the time oh, no. to try and stop the car. That was probably the earliest memory I, I remember and I remember the car. But I'd say the earliest car I remember was my dad had a gold Toyota Corolla and I think it was a, I've got to get this right, maybe a fifth generation. I think it was called the E80, like a square metallic gold car and it was kind of different from you know what my neighbors had so i'd say that was probably my earliest memory of a car and even then again i thought it was fairly dull really there was nothing nothing exciting and so the exciting stuff does start to to come through that was my earliest memory i'd say car wise i see a bit of a sort of french enthusiast obviously Toyota aside but citroen and peugeot bit quirky he always liked that like he's i think his his dream car was a was a ds mm -hmm. and he never he never kind and we talk about this now i say dad if you want to go and buy a ds you know you're retired now go and buy a citroen ds i mean you can still buy them mm. um even at you know one that's a bit rough around the edges you can probably find one for sub twenty thousand. um but that was his dream car and then he always used to go on about the cx mm. and the safari like, you know the biggest state safari mm. And again, we never kind of got around to that. And the BX was kind of the one that was, you know, sort of like next best to that. But my dad's one of these guys, you know, my mum and dad were both hippies, quite quirky. My dad was a psychologist, you know, in the 70s. It was long hair and flip flops, you know, full kind of Jesus mode. <laughs> and that, and that, was, that was him. So there were certainly quirky cars, but there was, there was minis and there was Morris Miners and, and, and Morris Minor Travellers and I remember them kind of coming and going. Yeah. So I don't know what they were doing with them, but I think they'd buy it and it would rot and they would sell it and they'd buy it and it would rot and they'd sell it. It was that. So take us in the car, I guess. Yeah. You and your brother are in the car and you go kind of on a yeah family trip or maybe a holiday or whatever. What's on the radio? Yeah. What's the atmosphere then? Like it was pretty, pretty cool. I mean, they, I was raised on, you know, the music that they sort of submitted me to was, was, pretty cool you know it was, my dad's idol was like bob dylan and we had like bruce springsteen and you know there was some cool 80s rock going on and like don henley and, and people like that yeah yeah so i remember the music 
being really good. I love that. Um, it was just the kind of I, I've come on this because I think what's interesting is that almost the embarrassment I felt of my parents' cars, it made me rebel. And I was <laughs> like, right, well, I'm going to get every single car that I possibly want now because I was I was just subjected to such what I thought was horror car wise. <laughs> I remember the memories like, you know, being driven to school and kind of like, you know, scooping down in, in the seats. Like, I don't want to be seen in this car. Drop me off around the corner, Dad. <laughs> yeah. And and what I did once was when uh, when I was about nine or ten, we, we actually moved up to Lincoln for a couple of years. And uh, I remember my dad had, had gone already um, and the removal truck had gone and we were left with my mum. And my mum had a brown Morris Minor 1000 and it had this kind of red PVC interior. Um, and I actually thought that car was quite cool in in an odd way Mm. my mum loved it she had a huge smile on her face and um we set off to lincoln and we were going so slow on the motorway and i had this little pad and pen and i started doing a tally of how many times we were overtaken (laughs) and how many times we overtook okay and i think it was it was in the hundreds for being overtaken and i think we overtook four cars (laughs) it's this stuff were they both cautious drivers your parents i would say so yeah i would say so my mum still is. My mum's still very much a cautious driver. My dad, I would say, maybe thinks he's a, a little quicker, but he's really not. They obey speed limits. And, you know, uh, my dad tells the odd story of when he had a mini and he raced his friend and whatever. I'm thinking, you didn't. There's no way you did that. <laughs> that didn't happen. But, um, yeah, it was it was just kind of a strange upbringing with cars, I, I, I would say. Um, but, yeah, the journeys were good. The music was good. So that's something, right? Yeah, definitely. Everyone, start your engines and visit Birmingham's NEC from the 8th to the 10th of November. Yes, it's the UK's premier classic motor show. Imagine over 3,000 cars to feast your eyes on, not to mention a record 330 vehicle clubs and hundreds of exhibiting companies. Shop for everything classic. You can even buy a car, meet motoring celebrities and experience all the action. Book your tickets at the NEC Classic Motor Show.com and join our 40th celebrations. What was it that lit the spark for you then? So obviously, I guess if you're cowering down in the back of a Toyota Corolla or whatever, you, you've got an awareness that this isn't the coolest car. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Is it someone at school had got a better one or what you'd seen on TV or? It wasn't school. Again, it was around 1990, something like that. My dad's brothers were both certainly more petrol heads than he was significantly. We went to visit his um, his middle brother, sort of. He's the youngest of three brothers. So the one who was in the middle, we went to visit him. And he just bought um, himself and his wife matching Mark II Golf GTIs. Oh, lovely. And it was like there was just one number off. It was like H, whatever it was, H381, H382, and then the rest of the number plate. And they were just sitting outside the house, both Tornado Red, I think it is, just sitting outside the house. And I thought that looks so, so, so cool. Yeah, yeah. And then a couple of years later, he then went and bought a, a brand new Cavalier GSI 2000. Nice. That was the defining moment for me. I remember going in that and I was like, this is the fastest car on earth. <laughs> There's nothing faster than this car that exists. <laughs> it was like a rocket ship, that thing. Mm. Um, that was what really, really boosted it for me. Yeah, they go well, the GSIs, actually, don't they? They sound quite good as well. That sort of ignited my love for certainly voxels it started off with for me so that's how it started do you recall kids at school with kind of cool cars i remember all the parents had pretty much terrible cars it was terrible this in brent cross or in lincoln no this was still north london so most of my memories so early memories of cars were pre i I was in london up until 10 years old Mm -hmm. i was then only in lincoln for two years and then I came back and all my kind of teens years were, were back in London again. So it was only two years up in Lincoln. But early memories from London were, you know, I had friends. Mum was Swedish and she was she was a little crazy <laughs> and she had a Fiat Uno and she'd pick us up from school occasionally. And we'd just go in the boot <laughs> and we'd face each other. My friend Chris and I and we would just the speeds she would go home just sitting, rocking around in an old Fiat Uno boot. Um <laughs> <laughs> but it's generally that sort of thing. It's pretty terrible cars, but certainly the, the characters and the personalities that drove them were, were the thing that you'd really remember. So your dad's choice of cars, was he sourcing those secondhand back in the day? Or was he going to a, a garage, do you think, for them? Or 
only the ones like the Citroen BX um, and a few that came later on. Again, it was just so bland. He then bought uh, like a Nissan Almira. He bought that new. Okay. And then about two years later, he then traded it in for a Primera. But we're not talking any good models. We're talking like two litre auto, fairly standard from the outside. And I just remember it thinking, you can do better than this. You're, you're better than this, Dad. <laughs> you know, some of those cars are considered fairly cool now, but... Mm. Did you have any influence, um, Paul, back in the day on his, his car choice? Was it only literally in later life where you've been able to sort of get a hold on it a bit? What was funny is that when I then got into cars, because I've had a lot of cars, a silly amount of cars, but I would buy something I like. And first he'd be like, well, what have you bought that for? I don't understand why you bought that. And then I think slowly he kind of came around to this whole concept that, you know, life's too short to drive boring cars. Mm. And, I, and I think he sort of thought to himself, I, I kind of understand why you're buying that. Um, it was never about materialism for me. It was always like the feeling that a car gave you. I, I wasn't interested in necessarily showing a car off to my mates. I was always interested in like going on long drives and just experiencing a car. Um, but there was no influence when I was young, but certainly the last decade, maybe 15 years, I think I've influenced my dad a lot in cars. See, it's been the other way around, mm. which is quite strange. Nice. You say, obviously mentioned his kind of sort of bland taste. Did he continue with the gold? for his sort of colours or no it was it was always the 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 nissans i think were the same color they were kind of this uh metallic -y red okay yeah sort, sort of burgundy red metallic which was an okay color sort of like a weak sort of black currant squash sort of color that sort of <laughs> no lighter than that lighter than right that. okay yeah <laughs> but yeah, yeah like even like it's kind of a, it's kind of an odd yeah i can't really explain the color maybe i have one black current then with a sand interior <laughs> sort of sand velour <laughs> uh, no i think i think yeah they they were gray velour interiors i think for the nissans um but there was never any pattern it was just so disjointed it was like one minute there was a little white bx and then it would be like an old mini, and then it would be a green Morris Minor Traveller, and then it would be a brown Morris Minor, and then it would be just bouncing around. There was definitely no loyalty to a brand or anything like that. It was that, that didn't happen. And I guess that's probably what happened to me later on. I've got no brand loyalty with cars. Mm. Were they using the vehicles for work, or were they just sort of, yeah, weekend things, or...? Andy, they were using these cars for everything. I mean, they were it was it was dump runs. It was like probably use it as a step to get up onto a wall. It was you know <laughs> the, car, the cars were just there. They were just like bricks outside the house, and you just do, you know it would be anything, any run, any off roading, and anything it didn't matter. So very little in the way of mechanical sympathy as well, I guess. Well, I think they would get them serviced by the you know the the local sort of grease monkey mechanic, but they weren't seen as items that were like your freedom as such, which is strange because they were hippies. Although I think my mum with the Morris Minor, she's got this real connection to it, and I think that was her kind of car of freedom. Yeah. Um, and she also talks about a mini she had with a little racing steering wheel when she was much younger. She apparently bought it off a friend of hers at school. And she was like, oh, it was amazing. I said, what was it, Mum? She said, I don't know. It had this little racing steering wheel. <laughs> I was like, but what was it? She says, well, it was a mini with a racing steering wheel. I was like, fine, <laughs> let's leave it. <laughs> was your dad hands-on or your mum with, with cars at all in terms of sort of mechanical side of things? My dad would give it a go. Mm. Yeah, my dad would offer to get out and, yeah, he'd put his hand to something. He definitely wasn't someone who was scared of the work. Or I, I think my dad, you know, he's a very intelligent man. Mm. My dad's a psychologist or he's now retired. And he also likes to believe that his intelligence relates to the practical side as well. So he certainly knows all the theory. Well, this is this item on a car. And he would tell me he would sit down and say, you know, Paul, this is an air filter and this is this. And he would he would know as to how good he was at actually doing it. I, I don't really recall, but I, I knew he, he knew about cars. Mm. He had a knowledge, which was interesting. Any breakdowns of note? um vehicle or human <laughs> several human breakdowns <laughs> several um i don't remember actually being stranded by the roadside the only time i ever remember being stranded is in a friend of mine called martin we got stranded in his mum's skoda rapide uh, fully deserved yeah in the hatfield tunnel oh no yeah, with just smoke billowing everywhere. And again, I'm literally like... At least people couldn't see you if you're in the tunnel with a Skoda. <laughs> I'm literally like, when is this going to end? When is someone going to be my saviour in the car world? It's this 
you know, it's, it's, I told you it's full on rebellion for me. It was a full on rebellion. How how I then ended up to to do my thing with cars. So yeah, they cropped up in a, in another recording we did, didn't they? Recently, Andy, the, the Rapide Goaders, yeah. And we think we kind of came to the conclusion that that's a car that's actually sort of come full circle. It's probably quite trendy now or a bit easier on the eye than it was back in the day anyway i think it's quite iconic now yeah you know if i see those repeat the you know the, the kind of fast back the coupe mm. with the slats on the window mm-hmm. yeah like this that actually looks quite cool now yeah but back then it was like you you drive a skoda and that that's not good news you know i had another friend's mum she had one of them a uh, larder nevers the little the little yeah four by four thing. Well, yeah. i don't think it was a four by four but the, that terrible thing. Oh, they did a Neva and a Reba, didn't they? I can't remember. I never remember which way round they were. But yeah, one was like a sort of three box saloon. Yeah, yeah. And then um, yeah, the other was an off roader, wasn't it? Yeah. In, in inverted commas. Wasn't a Reva also like a wafer type snack? Or am I getting mixed up with something there? Oh, we're just getting mixed in the whole eighties snacks now, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but what I do remember, there was some saving graces. My my granddad, he was a jeweler. It was, this was my mum's dad. He was like the refined one. So he would have things like the Toyota, but he'd have a Toyota Carina in grey with like fully loaded. And he'd say it's got everything. It's got the sunroof and it's got this. It's a, it's a beautiful car. And then he went out and he bought a um, Rover 827 SI, which was the, the Honda engine, the V6. Yeah. And that I thought was just, I'd, I used to, he used to pick me up and I used to think, this is class and leather seats and, you know, the walnut trim. And I thought, this is a, this is a beautiful car. Yeah. So I certainly had moments where you'd be exposed to these other cars where you're like, I can see what my life could be. Mm. You dream and say, oh, this is much better. <laughs> what color was the Rover, Paul? It was just gray. Everything my, my granddad bought was, was like class it was gray and it was timeless and it was like the best one that he could buy mm. i remember my first memory of a detailing product was my granddad had like he had armor all for the tires he'd always like put armor all on the tires and he'd wipe down the tires and he'd always be inside he'd just make sure everything was was perfect on the car and he, you know he was that guy he always wore a smart shirt and chinos and always had a nice watch on and he kind of like yeah this is this he knows what he's doing that was a nice memory you know I do love that era of gentleman. I was in the post office earlier in the week and a chap walked in to get his paper and he was, had the full blazer on with the suit. In fact, he didn't even get the paper off the shelf. The guy that was working there, he'd already tucked one behind the counter and he just sort of pulled it out and gave it to him. And then yeah, didn't even seem to pay for it either. He just sort of swanned off. I don't know what was going on there, but it must just be the suit. Just get away with stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I know you just get away. Yeah. <laughs> so that actually sparks another memory. So obviously I was a paper boy for, for for some years. I used to like cling on to my money for dear life and say, oh, I'm going to save it. Slave labor, paper boy, I always used to think. I used to do two rounds in the morning. Really? But I used to deliver to this block of flats in, in, in East Barnet. And this guy, I don't know who this guy was. He was like an Italian looking guy. And he had a Di Tommaso Pantera. Oh, wow. And I used to deliver to the guy and he used to just sit outside the block of flats. <laughs> And um, quite occasionally, I used to be riding my bike like back out down his road, and I'd hear it just fire up. It's just mad, like V8 rumble, like start up. And then you just quite often like see him. It was it was black, and it was oh what a car! Mm. And that was my exposure of like very exotic. And it was just in the middle of very normal cars. Yeah. And it, it just stood out like a sore thumb. And that's that kind of that first thing was like yeah, I want to I want to be that guy. Mm. You know. He was probably some, I don't know what he was, but he, he looked the part. Yeah. Yeah, what a cool car. Very. Especially back then as well. Like, you stick it in sort of the mundane surroundings of all the other vehicles on the road. It, like you say, it sticks out like a sore thumb. Yeah, and, and these things, I think, these are those defining times where I think, I don't actually know how old you guys are. I'm 41. Fine. 39. So we're the same era. I'm 43. So let's just say 40-ish. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, John, you're over the hill, mate. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Clinging on. I'm in my 30s still. <laughs> and we didn't have Instagram. We didn't have any exposure to all these car shows where there's thousands of photos of, of luxury cars. And quite often we'll see a supercar or a classic car. And we've seen it a hundred times before, even when we see it in the flesh. We know the owner. We know the car. Yeah. And back when our generation were sort of entering double digits in our lives, if we saw something like a Ferrari 348 go by, it was like a unicorn. It was like the most magical experience you could ever have. Yeah, yeah. And to see that Pantera 
it seemed so unattainable. Like it just seemed completely worlds apart. And the generation now don't have that magic. They don't have that now. Yeah, it's true. Which I think is, is a shame. It's like it jumped out of a packet of Top Trumps and it was there. Like That's kind of as close as you got to it, really. Or, yeah, I guess if you were reading... Were you reading car magazines back in the day as a kid? Or Yeah, I'd grab car magazines and I had uh, quite a few. I, I used to ask for those very big bumper books, which I've got now. I've got one called Power Cars and Supercars of the 80s. And I've got these big, huge Bible books of cars. And I would just read them for hours and hours. And I would point out to my dad, look at this car and look at that car. And I think he would kind of be like, yeah, it's great. Fantastic. Um, I've now got an 11 year old who's completely obsessed. He's got his own TikTok page up and obviously he's exposed to all sorts of things. So, yeah, I think I'm cultivating a monster there. I remember back, you might have had the same, you guys. I remember having um, one of those little sort of pocket books that you take in the car and it would have like... An I Spy, is it? Yeah, yeah. It's like... You have like a ticket off where it had points as well, didn't they? It start off with like a mundane, like, like a Rover. Yeah. And then, yeah, the top one would be a McLaren or something like ridiculous. Yeah. That's like you're saying now, if you took that out, it'd be, well, who cares? I'll just... I think it's a shame. I think it's a shame because even my 11-year-old, I'm trying to make him as humble as, as he possibly can be. But he obviously comes to a lot of events and shows with me and he's been out and experienced so many things. And he'll talk about certain cars as if they're just completely boring and average. Mm. And I have to stop him. You know, one of my cars that I love the best, I've got an M4 competition. I adore it. I'm not going to sell it. It's a very unique, rare color. But he almost sort of talks about that like it's a bit average. And I'm kind of like, stop, stop. You have to appreciate this older stuff. And he does. He 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 certainly the eighties cars and nineties cars he's got a real passion for. But it's the exposure. It's not normal, but social media will give you the impression that it certainly is. And I and I really want to try and instill into him that he's got to find his passion with cars, whether it be old, new, cheap, expensive. And and really just kind of stick to it. And and whatever he's exposed to, he's got to understand it's special. It's a special moment. There's a lot of, um, especially in London, a lot of kids, they just nip up to Knightsbridge now, don't they? And just look at all the supercars, yeah. um, all the sort of oil money and stuff up there. Yeah, It doesn't do it for me personally. I, like you were saying, I think um, you're saying you're not really into sort of the flashier stuff, but how the vehicle makes you feel certainly be more up my street as well rather than. A bright yellow Lamborghini or something. Yeah, I think that that's certainly... <sighs> there are so many good cars that aren't expensive. There are so many good cars. Mm. And the more that the younger generation understands this, the fact that we could go out with a tenor's fuel back in, you know, 99 or 2000 or whatever it was, and we would just have the best time in a car that even was known as performance, but by today's standards is pretty poor. Yeah, yeah. Which it would still be such an experience. It was it was that feeling rather than let's go and get the most expensive thing that will make you feel good. Mm. No, what will make you feel good is a really cool car. Be around your mates. Um, doesn't have to be expensive. Make it your own. That will make you happy. That's what I think. Anyway, it was it's almost a uh, kind of a business case for the opposite of like a supercar agency, isn't there? We need kind of a fleet of Mark Three Cavaliers where people can just hire one for the day take their kids out in them and kind of go, this is this is a taste of reality, son. This is what you're missing out. I'm looking over at my wife and she's my business partner. So we've started on the side to go with our business. We've started a company called Project Nostalgia. Okay, sounds right up our street. Yeah. And we want to do just that. We want to just find some really unusual, weird stuff. Um, we've got to find a place to put them all. And we're just going to start buying them up. And the first thing we bought for that was I found a little MGZR in a really rare color so how i justified it is I, as i said look my older son was uh 13 at the time i saw this car he's now 15 and i said that'd be a great first car for him wouldn't it let, let, let's buy that you know three years early <laughs> um and so now yeah we've got that and we're I'm, I'm trying to do work with him on it and and teach him how to maintain it and um it's also a cool car for us it's great when i go out in that it's lovely little memories and you know, put your garage on the on the stereo and you're there. That's quite a nice idea there, Andy. I like that, buying up a fleet of, sort of 80s and 90s vehicles. Experience state. Yeah, I'm not going to get that one past, uh, past... Take the kids via a wimpy on the way home or something like that, if you can find one. <laughs> exactly, yeah. 
So that's something that we're working on over the next um, two, three, five years. We'll, we'll start adding little interesting things. And, and we're not we're not after anything specific, but the idea will be that we'll try and buy them. And then we've kind of got a few partnerships with people who source things for TV and film. OK. And if we just get nice examples of these cars that were once very popular you never know it might become a business to to hire and rent out for for film shoots and stuff like that yeah um that's the plan that's the plan sounds good yeah i think it's nice that type of company does exist that you can go and kind of get a taster of it but yeah not everyone does want to go and drive a supercar do they and um can they afford to do that either so no i think you know things like saxo vtrs and 205s and things like 306 gti6 you know i have one of them almost new they meant so much to me back then. And I think that there's plenty of people that would have lost out on the opportunity to have one back then mm. and just think it's quite love to try one of them out. Yeah, yeah. And if I think that, there's got to be many people like me that think the same. Um, and I think that's our end goal, I think, is to is to work more on on that, building up a, a sort of a collection of interesting vehicles. I think that's what we're going to do. I used to buy and sell so much, not not to not to make a profit. I just used to try something for a few months, buy something else, buy something else. There was a few cars that I had real close links to, but most of them were just, I've tried that out. I want to try something else out now. But my attitude now, I've, I've got ADHD. So my attitude now is slow down, find the things you want to keep and keep them. Um, it's a bit of therapy for me as well. So it, it's, it's helping. Yeah, 90s hot hatch experience or something would be pretty cool. But see, I grew up around all those cars, but I've done the opposite to you almost. I've hoarded cars to the point where I just keep them until they fall apart or just for five, six, seven years. And I've never driven a 205 GTI. I've driven Mark 1 GTI Cabriolet, actually. Mark 2 Astra GSI, I don't think I've driven. Renault 5 Turbo, AX GT. All of those things would be great just to kind of have a runway. In. Yeah. So we'll go, here, here you go. Like you can, where you can drive, yeah, supercars or whatever, but something that's, I guess, aimed at our era. Yeah. And then maybe you've got kind of the next step up, which is like your Lancia Integrale or yeah. Evo or or whatever. But um... when I then got into, you know, when I started driving, straight away, I was like, right, I'm I'm just going to buy as many cars as I can to experience. And, and I did that. I li- literally went through a tick box of what, you should experience i had this crazy and it, and again it was it was this whole adhd thing my dad diagnosed me when i was in my early 20s i didn't actually know i i had all this i used to act in a certain way i was very um you know impulsive and um yeah i'd just go through and buy as many things as i possibly could um which was great but that was my gambling i suppose that was my gambling and and addiction go so far as to say i had a car addiction was there anything um your dad had Paul, that you'd like to try or maybe invest in yourself at some point? No, no, there's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Genuinely, nothing. I'm, I'm trying to get him at the moment. This is this is my latest plan. So he went down the whole motorhome route and he, he bought himself this motorhome a few years ago and he got a bit obsessed with it and he went on all these kind of Scottish Isles tours and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, but just before that, he had this thing in his head where he was desperate to get an, an early nsx automatic okay and i was trying everything for him to buy this car and he would see a few and they were kind of in his budget and i would say please make a move on it please and he ended up with his motorhome Mm. but him and my mum have just recently moved and i think there's a plan to sell the motorhome and you know he's coming up for mid 70s so right if you want that nsx you know, how many more years have you got the chance to get in and, and use it as you want to use it? Mm. So that's what I'm pushing for. I'm pushing for him to buy an NSX. That's a nice car, isn't it? The NSX. I do like those. Mm. Will it work? I don't know. I don't know whether I can convince him, but I'm, I'm going to give it my all. He's going to buy this car. <laughs> they must be going up, up, up all the time as well, I'd imagine. I think all these cars had these uh, 2021, early 22 spike and everything is, is settled now. Mm. So there was there was a couple that went through an auction a uh, couple of months ago and they did well but they didn't hit like mega mega money i think they were still in their 30s possibly early 40s but i still think you can get a reasonably priced one now when the market obviously then starts to turn and interest rates go down i don't think we've got much of an opportunity to get anything interesting i think we've probably then only got a few year window and then everything interesting i think is going to go crazy mm. that's my opinion interesting yeah, yeah. i have to start stockpiling 
need a bigger drive. Honestly, Andy, if you're after something, I think this next year is the time to make a move. I genuinely do, because there's stock out there. There's things to buy. If you want a 205 GTI, they're out there. 18 months ago, they weren't out there and they were fetching crazy money. And I am seeing deals now, but I don't think they're going to last long. Mm. I suppose there's an element of we're still seeing that impact of the COVID people were overspending, maybe indulging. And then sort of a few years down the line, it might get to the point where other financial things in your life are sort of taken a bit of a whack. So you might have to compromise and sell a toy here and there. That's what's happening now. Mm. There's much more pressure on a lot of people financially. I'd say even even the top end of the market. Mm. I'd say there's people that have got finance, loans, leverage, whatever it might be, that they're now costing a lot more. And they're thinking to themselves, well, let's have a look at what's physical and that I'm not using very much. Mm. And it'll often be something they bought in the last couple of years through COVID or maybe just before. And certainly that's a lot of the cars that we're getting on the market at the moment. Cars that are just kind of surplus to requirements. They're not being used. Yeah, That's what we're finding. We're being asked to sell on people's behalf. That's interesting. Um, it is interesting. And, and like I say, it's not going to last forever. I think it will turn back on its head again and we'll the, the trajectory for these cars will start going to the upside. Mm. I guess, yeah, with people's mortgages and stuff kind of rocketing, that's the, you've got to keep a roof over your head in that sort of stage one for your family. Yeah. And if you've got a 30, 40 grand car sat in the garage you can use at weekends, then what one are you going to get rid of? Yeah, and, and the problem is that... Sorry, darling, we're downsizing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, tell me about it. That's what I keep saying. Well, you know, we need more space. We can buy a small house with more space outside. And then that space can then house cars. I mean, they're, they're assets, right? That's the kind of thing that we're going for. <laughs> Stop putting them inside. We don't. We don't even use that dining area. Let's just. No, I know. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Slip a panda in there or something. We'll get some trays. We can watch telly and eat, and eat on our laps. Yeah, it's cozy. <laughs> but you guys, though, like, what would you make a move on at the moment? If it was something that you were looking at, what would you, what would you make a move on? It's. Um... I don't know, to be honest. I'm into Porsches. I've got a 944. Um, so I like the Transaxle Porsche. I like the 996. But the problem I've got with kind of that sort of level of vehicle is I've not got an income to support ownership. Yeah. You can kind of afford to get into one, but then you can't necessarily afford to maintain. Mm. Um, I've got kind of a VW background. So like your Mark II GTIs, that's probably kind of a decent staple for me. Because like, I could realistically run one as a daily mm. or kind of regularly and kind of have some fun with it, kind of go into events and stuff like that. Yeah, I'd never get away with having something that's 100 grand in the garage just as a toy. Then. Mm. Yeah, it, it wouldn't, and short of a lottery win, like, yeah, if that happened, then it's a bit different. But I've always fancied a catering, that's something along those lines. Yeah. But I've got a stupid car. That's a really stupid car, to be honest. Like, yeah. you can use it like three days a year. Exactly. But it's an itch to scratch. And I, I want an old Mini again. That's a, another one. But um. Yeah, it's funny. I I used to daily drive an Elise for a while, an early one, a, a 2000. And as much as I justified you could use it daily, um, at the time I was in property. I was I was an estate agent. And, you know, I'd turn up to meetings and, and kind of fall out the side of the car in a suit. And then I'd go back to it after the viewing and it wouldn't start. And it's like, oh, gosh. <laughs> and again, you, you took the roof off like, a couple of times a year because if it started raining to get it back on was just such a pain you need to get your allen keys out and your all that sort of stuff yeah and that's why I, that's why i kind of tried as many things as i could yeah, we had the conversation last week didn't we andy sort of the if you've got the crystal ball it'll be good to sort of as an investment point of view and the point that i kind of made was because i always think the 46 m3 is at a point now where it can't go any lower, even for a half decent one. You know, you can get into it for 15 grand, can't you? 15 to 20 grand, which for what you're getting is really good. But the point I was making was I think there's just still so many of them around that mm. until they start dying out, not necessarily dying out, but maybe just sort of getting tucked away in barns, all that sort of stuff, I just can't see the value rocketing. Yeah. I think people have been saying for five years now, maybe even more. Oh, this is the time to get involved, you know. They're gonna they're gonna start going up, they're going up, but they're not really. Not they haven't really crept that much, have they? I don't think. I mean, I've, I've had twelve of them. Have you? <laughs> yeah, I've had twelve E forty six M threes. Yeah, 
um, varying different ones. Um, yeah. But again, that's that, that's very much on my radar. Yeah. I, I do think, again, I think it's just getting through this period where people go, you have to have a coupe. It has to be manual. I've got to be honest. I've had a few manuals. That manual box is not great. No, I agree. I've got, I'm going to be so controversial now. It's quite tractor-like. It's got a really long throw. If it hasn't got quick shift on it, then it, I think it's a pretty rubbish box. The SMG... It's not as useless as people say it is. It's really not. It's not as bad as people think, is it? It's not. If it's got like a CSL map on it, and if you've got one that's sorted, and you actually get out into the open and, and give it something, mm. I think it's a really good box. If you use the stick rather than the paddles, that tends to be a better way of using it. Yeah, 100%. I rate them, I, and, and they differ massively. You can get into one, you think, this car drives rubbish. Mm. And then I, I had one in not long ago. We did a load of work on it, an Estral Blue one. And the box was so good. It was quick. It was responsive. It was a pleasure. It wasn't uh, skittish in traffic. Mm. I think if you get the right car, just, yeah, forget about the convertible. Again, I've had a few of them. And it's chalk and cheese, the coupe and the convertible. Mm. So get a coupe. But in terms of the box, if you get a good SMG, I wouldn't go to a car show, look into a car and go, oh, he's got an SMG. I'd be like, cool, wicked, lovely. I agree. Yeah. I'm a little bit of a three pedal snob, but I've not driven modern autos to be fair. I say modern autos, kind of, yeah. Yeah, we're getting more auto. I know it's terrible, but we're getting more auto. We really are. Um, we do like manuals, but. I haven't driven a manual for 10 years. Really? Yeah. No. I've only got one leg now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's like I'm a big Porsche fan as well, Andy. I'm, I'm a big Porsche guy, and um, I'd buy a PDK, I wouldn't buy a manual. Just because we drive it in London as well. Mm. And, you know, I know there's extra maintenance on the PDK. I know that. But I just think it's such a good gearbox. I think that the DCT BMW box, I think, is really good. You know, again, when it's all firing on cylinders and um, the MCT box on the Mercedes, uh, the C63, they're all so good that I love the manual experience. But certainly if you're if you're using it for mixed uses, if it's going in and out of town, the manuals get tiring very quickly. It gets it gets boring unless you're on the open road. Personally, mm. that's a good point. And yeah, that the autos these they're light years from. Yeah, I guess your dad's Corolla is Primera and Almira or whatever that he was buying, aren't they? Like back in the day, it was it was almost like a train, wasn't it? You sort of just had to slowly wait for it to waft through the gears. It's so bad. <laughs> I was fan with all the old autos, like some of the old Beamers I used to drive. If you dropped a gear in it, it it would sound like, you know, you're literally going to take off. Yeah, 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 yeah. Whereas in reality, it's just a slow sort of <laughs> lurch. It would feel like the rear axle's falling off every time you change gear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, you've got to check behind you, make sure you've still got a complete car. There were several roads near the village where I used to, well, in the village I used to live, where they had sort of like flint walls. So just get the driver's window down and drop a gear and it would sound awesome. But yeah, you're probably doing like, 20 to 40 max <laughs> i think the shift is designed by the same people who do mobility aids as well Probably. they were kind of as, as big as, as ugly as it can possibly be yeah I know. yeah make sure that button's really big for like the old lady or whatever yeah and then now like the, the latest like the 992 porsche it's like this little stump so it's like a little stump that you just move and that's it you're in gear it's like you didn't need these giant things like this click Click, click, and the jag ones, like the whole dog leg, like oh, the horseshoe, yeah, round the corner and down and round. You know, um, it's fun. You you wouldn't get the wrong gear as such, but you know, also it's uh, completely unnecessary. But yeah, to bring those back, shouldn't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for joining us, Paul. We'll wrap it up there. We could chat all day. Fantastic. No, like really appreciate your time, guys. I'll keep you posted on uh, on BX sightings in the future. Hopefully, I'll see it around again. Yes. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. See you later. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye bye. Cool. There we go. A full circle episode. Yeah. Car spotting tennis through to guest on podcast. Yeah. I wonder if you're going to do a sneaky edit on that one and uh, make out that that bit was dropped in midway through. <laughs> I don't know, actually. Uh, Seemed to work all right, didn't it? Yeah, I think so. Mm. I think it's a, it's a sort of a natural start, wasn't it? So, um, yeah, good stories. Yeah, obviously, from one extreme to the other, really, is, is kind of dad's mundane choice of vehicles through to his kind of, I guess, almost addiction to buying cars. It's a bit like um, when your parents smoke, you completely go against the grain, isn't it? Sometimes that's what he's done with cars, basically. He's, the mundane has forced him into not being mundane. Yeah, rebelled. And yeah, the idea of having fleet of sort of more normal cars for people to borrow. Um, yeah, 
best of luck with that. I think that's, uh, there's probably some mileage in it. Yeah, it might tie in quite nicely to the uh, event idea of, well, not like the revival, but an 80s or 90s version of it. Yeah, I think uh, there's still something there, isn't there? Rent a car from Paul to take uh, for the weekend or something like that. Yeah. It's all, yeah, all coming together. <laughs> but let's not do that this year. I've got enough on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we should probably encourage people still, if you are enjoying this, we'd love to um, to receive some coffees. And what's it going to go towards? We've got some cheap microphones, which probably could do with uh, replacement. Yeah. And at some point, my computer that I edit on is going to go back. <laughs> so um, if we're going to edit stuff with video, um, yeah, the asthmatic processor within it is probably uh, going to... Uh, There's only so many spot worlds that machine can take. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's probably the next thing to move towards, which is obviously quite a big ask. But uh, yeah, if you don't ask, you don't get. And um, yeah, slowly, slowly, we'll uh, we'll do it. Yeah. So Cool. Okay, John. Cheers, mate. We'll um, wrap it up and um, roll the credits. Thank you for listening to My Dad's Car. I hope you enjoyed the show. Please support us. Buy us a coffee and subscribe. And tell all your friends.